I'm just going to assume we're live. Um, yeah, we are live. Here we go. How about that? All right. Welcome to the channel CEO podcast. Uh, before we jump into today's guests, I have the obligatory uh, notes I have to read about uh, the upcoming uh, roadshow. So this uh, podcast is brought to you by the MSP M&A Growth Show. Is it isn't your typical roadshow or uh, snooze fest conference? It's where MSP owners and execs ready to make serious moves come to learn the in and outs about getting acquired. We've had a couple of them. We had uh, one out in Costa Mesa, California. We had one up in Chicago not too long ago. Uh, but this is really about scaling up and how to dominate the M&A game uh, moving forward. So you'll get straight talk from industry experts. Uh, there's some killer networking. There's one-on-one -on -one matchmaking with some of the, the private equity groups and some of the large MSPs that are rolling up other MSPs. So really it's your chance to get uh, some you know, really behind the scenes uh, insider baseball and what's going on in the market and uh, be introduced to the, the who's who in this space. Uh, next stop is Newark, New Jersey, October 24th. So coming up in just over what, three weeks from now. Uh, so don't sleep on it. Space is limited. I've seen uh, at least five or six registrations come in this morning. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a, a packed audience. And so look forward to seeing you there. All right. Without further ado, we're going to bring on uh, today's guest. Um, I think this is uh, probably our fifth or sixth uh, Texan that we've had on the show. So this is going to be another interesting uh, episode. I'm, I can assure you that. So let me uh, bring on Mr. Zane Conkle to the uh, podcast. How are you doing, Zane? Hey, Kevin. Doing great. Great, man. Thanks for joining us. Obviously, you're the, the CEO of Citricom. You guys are moving pretty darn fast in the marketplace. And so it's great to, great to have you on today. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Looking forward to connecting with you. Yeah, so we did this thing uh, prior to uh, each show. We have uh, kind of these these show notes helps uh, me stay a little organized and you know on topic on point. But uh, yes, you mentioned a couple things in in the notes, right? That you know, I guess entrepreneurship seems to be in in the in the, the blood and the family and the genes, or what have you. But uh, you alluded to the fact that Citricom wasn't your first uh, venture. Uh, there's one actually, I think when you're around 18 years old that you had a successful exit. Did I read that? I read that right. Yeah, that's right. All right. So tell me about that one. Yeah. So we, um, prior to Citricom, I ended up actually operating an MSP practice. And so I, I grew up, I guess the backstory is I grew up in a small rural town, uh, Northeast of Dallas. And when, uh, you know, you know when I was growing up, it was 8,000 people. And I watched this town over my childhood explode, uh, you know, over 40,000 people. And, uh, you know, my, my family had some buildings in downtown, uh, in, in downtown Wiley. That's a city I grew up in. And I was able to talk my grandfather into let me have one of these buildings and turn it into a computer repair shop. Hmm. And so I did that when I was 15. So I would get out of school early and go run this thing. And, uh, and it turned into what today we'd call managed services. So the businesses in the local area, uh, we would manage their network. Uh, and I mean, e e just, just like anybody else, you know, everything from retail uh, to professional services, whether it's the law firms, the accountants, tax season was always fun. Uh, like you just know to be on tap. And uh, so ran that for a few years, uh, sold it, exited that business uh, and, and started Citricom. Huh. So what were the uh, early lessons or early takeaways from that, from the first go around, you know, you know, running an MSP, scaling MSP, being that young and then exiting an MSP? Yeah. I mean, there, there are so many, I mean, I think at the end, at the end of the day, if I could just boil it down to a category, I think you, you really just learned, I learned a lot of empathy and I learned to, um, it gave me a different perspective, you know, obviously as, as an operator, operating a, a practice, you know, getting the calls late at night, seeing, um, you know, seeing my customers, uh, if something wasn't working right, uh, the responsibility and the pressure for that, I'll never forget that. You, you can't take that away. Um, so, but I mean, I think I boiled down to just, just an empathy and really a, a, a deep, uh, a deep care, uh, for the customer and for the experience is really what came out of that. So I'm, I'm, what I'm visualizing and, and maybe I'm, I might be off base here, but I visualize you, you know, you're in school. I don't know if it's beepers back then, but probably cell phones. You're getting out you know, hey, and you go into the teacher and say, Hey, can I get out of class? I got to go fix this. <clears throat> Anything like that? Yeah. So I, it, it was, it was close to that. Yeah, exactly. So I ended up being able to get out 
by lunch every day uh, by the time I was in high school and I graduated a year early. I was able to convince the uh, the school counselors to let me go to they had a summer program where kids could catch up that were behind. And I essentially convinced them to let me do my senior year over this summer. I did it. I did my senior year in like six weeks or something. I can't remember. Uh, eight weeks, something like that. But I wanted to I wanted to get that done, knock it out. Um, and so essentially I graduated a year early that helped before that I had a, a work program where I could get out at noon. Um, and we, and I had, you know, we grew the business where we had people working for us. So, you know, the gap there was, was short anyways, the team was able to take care of it in the, you know, when I wasn't there, but regardless, I, uh, it, it, it was, it was no uh, secret that I wanted to be, you know, at the shop and not, uh, not sitting in class. And, yeah. you know, there, there are things, you know, it's funny, there are things just talking about that you're making me think about. I, um, you know, I never paid much attention to math in school, which is a topic I absolutely love and spend tons of time with. My kids love it. And, uh, you know, if there's one, if there was one regret in school, it was not leaning in more aggressively there. Hmm. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it, it was interesting. And look, I don't think I could get away with what I got away with back then. Uh, it was, you know, it was small and, uh, people understood it. I mean, here's, here's the funny thing about it. And this, 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 I don't think I've ever told anybody this It's a fun fact. I have, uh, I've, I've been on, I've been an employee one time in my life and it was at the school district and I essentially ran their, um, their production and media environment. And so, you know, it's, I had, uh, I had a unique situation. It was a unique environment where I was able to move around and, uh, I had the flexibility we needed. So it, it worked out ultimately. Well, that's, that's cool. So, so you, uh, obviously a lot of takeaways, a lot of lessons learned. Uh, and so what's, uh, what's next, what's next in the kind of the, the, the evolution of matriculation, is it jumping right into the com at that point or was there a gap or, or what was, uh, what was, what led you down the path to Citricom? Yeah. So while I was operating the MSP, you know, I, while I was operating the practice, I had a handful of customers that were on traditional phone systems, traditional key systems that wanted to move to VoIP. I mean, this is, you're talking 2007, 2008. Okay, cool. And, um, you know, there are a couple of vendor, you know, big vendors out there that sold direct and we would deploy those into our customers' environments. Uh, but it became very clear to me, these vendors don't understand the way that I go to market with my customers, not only from a sales perspective, but also they don't understand the relationship. Um, and so I just saw a huge opportunity to, to build something different that was easy for MSPs to deploy. As I spoke to peers in the community, I realized that a lot of MSPs were uh, at the time, and this is, this is changed right now. I even say it's still changing. MSPs were at the time very, um, you know, very standoffish as it related to deploying voice into their customers' networks. Uh, they didn't want to be responsible for that. They didn't want to put their managed service agreement at risk. Sure. Yep. Valid concerns. Uh, and so I just saw a huge opportunity to build something unique for this market. And we went and built it. Uh, there is a crossover period. I mean, we were we were building this and, and getting it off the ground before um, we exited the MSP practice. Got it. So I, I can I can certainly sympathize and, and understand. I mean, the... Uh... So I, I worked at a, a CLEC right after, you know, Ma Bell was broken up and okay. uh, the number of companies that we blew up, I mean, you know, migrating over to our, um, actually, I think they're a Texas based company and I come to think of it, it was called Allegiance Telecom. Okay. Uh, they, uh, you know, they were one of the, you know, it was at the promise of the, uh, the dot com, you know, you know, dream. And it was one of those ones that went up and it went straight down just like everybody yep. else. So I feel okay talking about and throw them on the bus, you know, 20 plus years later, but, um, gosh, I mean, the number of, um, number of companies that we blew up I mean, like you go, you start, you know, in sales and you go to friends and family first that are running these small businesses. And I just, yeah. So I, I understand fully the, the hesitation for, uh, MSPs, particularly around that point, because VoIP is just now, you know, starting to, you know, become a thing. Um, you know, you got your, your T1s, your T3s, and then kind of this, you know, progression to VoIP and, and those types of solutions. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, you're, you're, you're jumping into a, a pretty, um, not precarious, but you're jumping into a, a segment of the industry. That's, you know, you talk about CSAT scores and, you know, you mess up once, 
and then you know the, the darling child of the industry and then you're down for 15 seconds or you know, 15 minutes then you know you're toast and so i mean you know jumping into that marketplace that takes a lot of uh a lot of uh a lot of a chutzpah i guess right yeah i mean look i i tell our team we talk about this all the time if you look at what Citricom does, you know, first off, I would tell you, I never, it, it's funny you mentioned that, you know, I grew up, obviously growing up in Dallas, you know, they call it, uh, you know, they call it Silicon Prairie out here. So Richardson had Nortel and Ericsson and all the major players out here. I mean, it's a massive telecom hub. And of course, as a kid, you know, we I drive through all these massive buildings. I didn't, re I didn't realize it. And I had no intention of ever being in quote unquote telecom. In fact, I would tell people that we're you know, we were never in the phone business. We really built software. We just happened to make phones ring. But to your point, you know, the credit, you know, the level of um, the level of criticality of the services that we deliver, I would argue like th there's no, I, I can't point, you know, I can point to very few vendors that have the, that are held to the expectations that we are held to. And this is something that we talk about consistently, whether it's uh, our voice product or if you were to look at, uh, you know, control one, our network security product. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, our, our core competency as an organization is to build and secure the critical infrastructure uh, that powers uh, the environments that our MSP support. And that, I mean, that's really our core competency. And we, we do the hard things. Um, and we, we really believe that we have the experience uh, to maintain and build these, these critical networks. Uh, but you're, you're right. It is, uh, it's funny looking back, you know, how you, how you get to, to where we are today. And it's, it's, it's been, it's been a journey. It's been great. And we're, we still have a lot of, uh, we still have a lot of, uh, learning and a lot of road to, to road. Yeah. So, you know, since you're, you're kind of, you're, you're taking kind of this really aggressive early, early adopter or, uh, first mover advantage, but you're, you're, you're kind of, you're shifting the the narrative to kind of a software based uh, organization before you're talking about connectivity and you know and and telephony and stuff like that, uh, and you're doing it at a time where it was challenging for the hardware side of the marketplace. It's you know, obviously it's gotten even more increasingly challenging, you know, with hardware and and the kind of the shift from you know kind of the 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 capex to opex models, but you know. Any particular challenges as you were as you were scaling through kind of the the late you know call it two thousand eight two thousand nine into the you know the teens any 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 particular uh, things stick out as as super challenging in that kind of progression? Yeah, I mean, I look, I think there are so many. I think there are so many examples you could point to. Building, especially in those early days, building a uh, building a business a startup is ninety percent perseverance and and uh, ten percent vision. I mean, you just you wake up every morning and, and, and push. I think there are a lot of things, but I think to the point that you just raised, I mean, I think it's a valid one. At the end of the day, we, we bootstrapped this business, um, started this business with a couple thousand dollars and, you know, it, it became clear, you know, as we were gaining market share, gaining MSPs, uh, it took us a while, number one, to, to bring the product to market. We spent quite a bit of time really perfecting the product. Um, and I would tell you now it's not perfect, but like, you know, essentially getting it to a place that we, we really felt, um, it, it deserved to be in the market. And we, uh, we essentially, you know, went for, went for several years and it became, you know, it becomes very clear at some point that, look, you've got to, you're actually doing harm to the business by not raising capital. So we essentially partnered with a growth equity firm and, you know, that, that's really been amazing for us, you know, a lot of learning opportunity, you know, a lot of learning there, a lot of opportunities that, you know, we could have maybe taken earlier, taken advantage of earlier. Um, but, you know, I think scaling a business, bootstrapping it, there, there are a lot of things. You obviously have the constant constraint mm -hmm. of um, limited, limited capital, limited resources. And I think that, you know, the other side I'll tell you, I think it's actually really good uh, because it teaches a discipline that quite frankly, I would tell you in 2024, most people don't have, mm -hmm. um, but with that comes a whole host of challenges for sure. No, oh, definitely. Yeah. It, it's uh, it definitely is forced discipline. It, I think it teaches you, you know, to be uh, nimble and, and maneuver, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, being, you know, adaptable, but you know, that's, that's interesting, right? Because you're essentially kind of taking this product led growth 
mindset, right? And getting real aggressive about building product, you know, you know, making sure you have the, the technical expertise, the depth, you know, technical, you know, the depth of the technical solution. Um, in most companies, you know, they start more kind of product and you know, or sales and marketing led organizations, and they often get caught up to the point where they they're like, "crap, I got to really start to invest in the technical side." So, you kind of, you know, I, I think you did it the right way, right? You're you're starting with really you, before you come to market and start to scale, and then kind of test it on your customers, and you know, potentially have that you know that gap. You're kind of driving kind of that product led you know growth, uh, and then getting to the point where. You know, I don't know if it was natural. I mean, I guess, or there was like certain inflection points where he said, "All right, we gotta, we gotta bring in capital." Was it, was it now we've got, uh, you know, really stable, solid core group. We got customers. We're starting to get some velocity, and now it's time to bring in private equity for, you know, or, or capital for the uh, acceleration. Or was it, you know, to have more discipline brought into the organization? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really just to support the growth. If you look at. Uh, and, and you brought you brought it, brought it up. Look at hardware. Just take that as one example. The amount of hardware. So we we use custom hardware, runs our firmware. We have a uh, essentially JDM relationship with a vendor in the space. Well, you think about uh, okay. Number one, nearly nobody does that, and certainly when we did that, nobody hands down full stop did that. Um, but we wanted to control the experience from end to end, and we knew in order to deliver a superior experience, we needed to control all the way to the endpoint. Well, that's great, but the problem is, you know, if you're going to do custom hardware, you know, you can't order these at 20 at a time. I mean, I'm literally getting, uh, you know, we're getting these things shipped over, you know, multiple times a year. And, you know, the cost to do that is uh, is not cheap. And so you, you most certainly have to forecast forward. And it became clear that, look, on, based on the growth, if you look at the events that we were going to, the events that we sponsored, the demand from partners, the larger customer bases, um, you know, try, trying to bootstrap it. There, it reached a point where there was no sense. The model was very clear. I mean, you could set your watch. Um, you knew exactly. You know, I could forecast exactly what a, what an MSP was going to do um, and what the short-term cost would be, et cetera. And so bringing in growth equity just really alleviated that stress point and let us go back to focusing on delivering value to the, to the business or to uh, delivering value through the business to the, to the partner and the customer. Right. Right. So let's get into the kind of the product set, right? Cause you started, you know, kind of this down this void path and then you've kind of expanded the product set. So what was uh, kind of the early, you know, what was the early vision and then how's that expanded out to this product, I guess, portfolio that you guys have now? Yeah. Great question. So uh, again, I'll go back to what I said at the top. Our, our mission has really been, or our focus in core competency is really on building critical infrastructure. And our mission has been to uh, connect, uh, the, you know, we would refer to modern, we refer to as the modern workforce. And so we started with a voice product, migrated people to, to VoIP again at the time. It was uh, early stage adopters. We essentially brought the category into the MSP space. Um, you know, oftentimes we'd be the only voice vendor. Uh, in those early days. So that product has been in that category of products that we have has been very successful, continues to be very successful for us. Uh, if you look at Control One, so the network security product that we brought to market a little over two years ago, similar story. Uh, we essentially brought a set of capabilities that have historically been reserved for enterprise or up market. We've brought those capabilities down to the MSP market made it easy for them to deploy, um, a, you know, what you would term a SASE product, mm -hmm. essentially deploy zero trust, um, a network or a cloud-based network, uh, made that easy to deploy into your customer bases. And so we've, uh, again, been, that product has been very successful as well, but all of that, you know, the, the backstop of all that is, are we solving critical infrastructure issues? Uh, are we helping connect and protect users? And what you find is these two products go very well together. Um, if you look at the vision, you, you think about the the product, the overall roadmap. As you talk to MSPs as we've deployed voice over the years, the number one thing MSPs will always tell you is when deploying voice, it's critical you get the network set up correctly. It, it's an over-the-top application. Yeah. So if the ISP has issues, if the network is not configured correctly, then you end up with uh, call experience challenges. They we call quality, 
call setup issues. There's a whole host of issues. Um, and so what we've done is we said, look, how can we eliminate that, uh, that pain from our MSP and from our part, from our partner base. And so that was one of the things that led us down this path as we were looking for a solution to that problem. And if you look at control one, that essentially allows us to do that. We displace the firewall, uh, and in doing so, uh, you essentially remove all the challenges that historically come with that as it relates to the voice side of the network, as well as a whole, a whole host of other applications, whether it's zoom or anything else you're running. Right. Um, so th those two pair together and that's, uh, you know, high level kind of how we got to where we were with control one. And we're seeing today that, uh, you know, we have, we have our, the UC product that continues to grow control one has just, you know, has blown through every expectation and plan that we've had. Uh, and interestingly enough, you know, the people that come in for control one are, um, they may be working with another voice vendor. We find that once they get into the product that they end up adopting our, our voice solutions as well. Yeah, it's funny. I, I imagine, in fact, I, I remember having a conversation with uh, an MSP. I forget one of the, uh, one of the events not too long ago, but I, I imagine that you guys have a pretty high rate of, of displacement. Um, you know, once you're, once you're in and then they actually understand kind of the, 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 the broader capabilities of what you guys are putting together. So that's, it's gotta be, uh, pretty rewarding everyone, you know, it's easier, obviously net new and kind of, you know, you know, brand new, um, like uh, deployments, but I think the displacement, I think talks to, uh, I think the, the architecture and, and kind of the, the, you know, fundamentally the, the problems that you guys are solving. Yeah. And I think what, what you see is MSPs want to consolidate and they, they have enough to deal with, you know, tool sprawl is very real. Um, so MSPs want to consolidate and they want to standardize on, on solutions. And so, yeah, what, you're, what we're seeing with Control One is that MSPs will deploy it into their customers. We'll do some proof of concepts early on, but very quickly move to standardizing across their entire customer base. And so, you, you take the you know take traditional. Uh, we've been talking about hardware. Just take take the hardware side of the house. The traditional firewalls. I mean, we have literally piles of them in our office where MSPs have sent those back to us. Right. So the Fortinets, the Meraki's, the Sophos, the Sonic walls, I mean, every day, like we have MSPs to, to, displacing every single one of those in their environment uh, and standardizing on control one. And uh, it, it just the amount of capabilities that you get from control one, the amount of effort or energy you have to exert to get that is, is so much lower. Um, it becomes a no brainer for, for an MSP. It really is. It really has shifted the paradigm on how MSPs think about connecting and securing uh their customers yeah look i, I again I, I think you're gonna have a material impact on hardware in general right i mean it, it's it's you've seen kind of again going from you know the capex to opex and then you know the hardware providers trying to you know bolt in and be kind of software first change their business models or pricing models but at the end of the day you're like disrupting that entire the entire chain right you're almost making it obsolete to, to some degree yeah i think so and uh, yeah i think so and the way that it doesn't align to the way that MSPs, this is another thing that we haven't touched on, but you made the comment, like we, we lead with product and we absolutely do. Like we are a product led organization mm -hmm. and we invest heavily there and we, but you can have the best product in the world. It doesn't matter. I think the magic for us and the team is just so incredible uh, that I get the privilege to work with at taking the products that we've built and enabling our MSPs to be successful with those. There are plenty of great products out there, but if the, you know, if as an MSP, I'm not equipped to be successful with it, to take it to my customers, it doesn't matter. I can't, uh, I can't mobilize it and deploy it. And so, you, you know, to your point, I do think that, that, that we are shifting the way that, that, that people think about this, you know, and I think that, you know, that, that's one of the things that became very clear to me, go all the way back to where we started this. I had my MSP practice and, you know, through COVID I'm, I'm looking around and it, it, it blows my mind that the industry still deploys networks the way that I did when I ran my MSP practice. Literally nothing has changed. Right. Yeah. The, the network yeah. is, we think of the network as it, it's location centric. We have this construct. It's, it's location centric. You know, the network is at the office or at multiple offices. And maybe we connect them via VPN or whatever, but that's not the way the world works. You know, at the end of the day, your users, your applications, 
your data, your data, like all these things have moved out of the physical building. Yet we still have this idea that, oh, the network is in the building. So it, it's just, it was, it was crazy. To, it was crazy to me. And so just changing the way, you know, helping the industry or, or helping the channel think about, um, how can we approach this differently? I think is a, is a great challenge and, you know, something that we're, we're working on and continue to evangelize and talk about every day. And so as you, as you see kind of this further evolution of, of kind of moving away from, you know, being inside the four walls and, you know, you got, you know, devices and kind of this massive growth of IOT and endpoints, whatever. Uh, how do you guys think about that as far as, you know, your product roadmap and kind of how you're going to evolve, you know, the platforms and, you know, next couple of years yeah so we're going to continue i think one of the things that's one of the things that's very clear on the control one side with network security you, you talk about it etc you have to have full coverage and we're, we're very big about protecting every device every user every device um, and we try to make that very easy and, and say like you should be able to do that as an as an msp with a with a very at a very clear price point where you're not having to to pick and choose okay i'll protect this user on this device, it's like, no, if you're supporting a, a client, every single device in that organization should be covered and should be protected, should be under a unified policy. Uh, and so we're there today, and uh, but we want to continue to increase the capability set. So uh, what I would tell you is, if, as you look forward, you're, we're making huge investments around uh, our reporting and visibility capabilities. I mean, could you think about it? We essentially have, we have more observability than anybody in the stack. We view every single packet, every network flow. Um, we know every application and process that's running within the environment. And so how can we better surface that information for our partners and help them? So we have a lot of really, really cool and really exciting things coming out on that front. There are a whole host of things that we're doing on the threat protection front. So if you look at the, the team that's focused on uh, advancing our security capabilities and you end up with, I'll give you a good example uh, of something that we, we recently did. I won't name the vendor, but we've had a couple of major big vendors that have been, uh, leveraged for supply, for supply chain attacks in, in the MSP space. And we, because of the, the uh, because of where we sit in the stack, because we're focused on MSPs and we have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of MSPs and networks that are deployed where we essentially manage the network uh, and can observe the network, we can very quickly detect anomalies. And so uh, we were able to catch those, those attacks. Uh, one of them was an, RM, was an RMM vulnerability, and we were able to stop that before the vendor even released and announced that there was an issue there. And so the question is, so there, there's a lot of work that we're doing in that area. Um, we want to, we want to make it much, uh, we think that there are a lot of things that we can do to give MSPs peace of mind and make them much more proactive. And ultimately at the end of the day, this, this, this all boils down to operational, you know, driving operational gains and efficiency. Sure. Um, we want an MSP to be able to standard, we're already seeing it. Partners standardize are standardizing on the solution. They should be able to go apply a change in one place and it cascades and rolls out across the entire customer base. And so we're there today uh, and we're continuing to, to push that uh, further. So there, there's a whole host of things that, that we're doing on that side of the house, on the UC side of the house. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm having to bite my tongue. I'll get in trouble with the team, but there's a, we have some major, major releases where we've made uh, just, honestly, I, I would tell you the, the biggest investment we've ever made in that product. And so we've got some, really incredible things that are that are coming out and um we're, we're really excited about that that's awesome I, I i can't let you off the hook too much but um you know i, I think that is one interesting um let me think about this uh, you know the, the volume of data right and, and kind of parlay that into kind of this massive data set this threat intelligence data set uh, I assume, you know, some of the buzzwords like AI and, and predictability and modeling, I think that's, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's on the roadmap. Is that part of like where you're going to go in general? Yeah, absolutely. And what I would, and what I would tell you is, uh, yes, we, we have folks on staff full-time just focused on that, on, on, on the data engineering side, on AI engineering side. 
and we're uh you know we're we're using it like most organizations think aggressively in inside and i'm not talking about purchasing something off the shelf like we're developing tools to enhance the experiences you engage with us whether you're engaging with our support or success teams um but in product delivering that value for the msps there are huge opportunities again the at the end of the day you know these these foundational models are are uh, you know we've reached a point where they're fairly fungible but the, the data is what really drives different outcomes and yeah we, we believe that the data we have is is very unique mm -hmm. uh, and so there we see a lot of opportunities there's a lot of things that we're that we're doing there there's very clear things on the roadmap that we're executing against what i'll tell you is we're not um we have no interest in in delivering something slapping an ai label on it for marketing purposes it's just not in the dna of, of who we are if it doesn't provide significant value we're not going to release it yeah i think the industry's uh, on to that uh in general i think there was yeah about a six month period where everyone was kind of biting you know and and falling for it but then i think that's cooled back and uh you know we're kind of mentioned we're gonna have a, a pretty massive industry report uh coming out here in, in about uh about five days six days that's uh time we're, we're doing this live and recording this uh I think it's five days out, so it'll be on uh, October 8th. But we talk about kind of that evolution, kind of the, the spike in interest in AI and then kind of settling back and then really people trying to figure out, I mean, what does that mean? How do we, you know, operationalize that inside of our products and not just use it as a bud, buzzword? Yeah. So you have that. But then, again, I keep going back to that. There's, um, you know, it's almost like this, especially where you are, right? It's a really interesting kind of progression because you're going from, you know, solving kind of this VoIP telephony, right? Then you get kind of the, the edge to the network, you're seeing the infrastructure. So, that, you know, it's a very, you know, some organizations, that's, a, I think, a very natural progression, natural leap. Some, I think, might have been challenged to kind of go down that path. The fact that you guys now No, I think I lost you. Maybe me or maybe you. Are you there? Yeah, there. there yeah, there, there you are. How about that for doing this live? Can you hear me? Oh now? man, even even better. There, you know, yeah. So. All right. Again, new studio, second second podcast. So uh, I, guess, I guess apparently got some uh, other bugs to work out. But man, I felt like I was on a roll there. Damn, I lost my train of thought. I, uh, I, knew, I, knew, I mean, I, I could see you. I knew it was good. It was so yeah. good. I, I'm just, I haven't practiced reading lips well enough to. Damn, all right. So what I was saying uh, is that, um, you know, you, you took this like, you know, by some standards, it's a natural, you know, evolution, naturally, you know, looking at kind of, kind of, boy telephony managing kind of communications and then getting you know, going you know to infrastructure managing you know what's coming in and out what have you uh but you know to have the the team and the foresight to think through how can you lever kind of this this threat intelligence and then combine that with again where things are going with ai and and uh you know the market in general i think it's uh i think it's really fascinating where you guys could go i mean that's you know i try not to be i, I try not to give um I don't know too many uh, of my own personal thoughts, or you know, this is about you and all. But I mean, I just I, I think you guys have probably five or six really amazing you know swim lanes downstream that you can you know, pursue. And I think one of the challenges is probably you know you know, picking one or two of them and executing. It seems like you've done a pretty damn good job at this point. In fact, you have done a pretty damn good job of of kind of again being product led and then executing. But man, it seems like you're at this inflection point where you know you can solve you know. A whole bunch of different challenges, and even further consolidate, you know, as you talked about earlier, the tool sprawl. Because right? there's probably just in you know the conversation the last five minutes, probably four or five different solutions that you guys would touch that you could almost I don't it would be too bold, but make obsolete as well, just like what you're doing with the firewalls. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly, it. and we are and we are doing that today, right? So. Um... You know, and we don't, I mean, there, it doesn't take, you don't have to think very far to see like, the, what are the categories of tools that MSPs are displacing with the product? Um, you know, you've got, 
which is ultimately ends up making it easier for for MSPs to manage. But yeah, I mean, look at the end of the day, we the opportunity is clear. It's funny you mentioned the lanes because that's exactly how we think about the roadmap. The teams are oriented that way, so we have very clear lanes, you know, thematic lanes, and the skill set of the product and engineering team is aligned to those lanes, and they're ex and they execute and run. Um, you know, we don't the team doesn't move as a the team's too big. You know, they don't they don't move as and work on one initiative like we work on multiple things. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're pursuing these things where and at the end of the day, what it really boils down to is it has always been about um, helping, you know, solving solving the big challenges for MSPs in, in ways that that I believe that only we can because we understand this market. If you look at the team uh, that we have, you know, the majority of folks have come from the MSP industry, at least in, in the leadership perspective, and we. Uh, the team collectively is very, very, very passionate about this community, about this market, and we want to solve the problems for that that MSPs face because we've all been there, and you know we we believe that we're positioned to do that. And at the end of the day, it's about helping MSPs win in, in their local markets uh, and, and do so and, and get and essentially get outsized leverage where they can compete uh, in different and unique ways. Yeah, well, you guys are doing one hell of a job. Uh... So far, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm uh, eager to see what you guys end up doing, and hopefully get you get you back for a couple of these uh, upcoming announcements because I imagine they're going to be pretty uh, pretty kick butt. But uh, now with that, I, I just want to thank you for uh, jumping on. We'll have obviously links to Citricom and and to you and in, in the show notes, and, and absolutely, I mean, I think uh, it's definitely worth a look because uh, there's probably, as I mentioned, you know, at least two or three different solutions that you can look at uh, displacing or replacing. Uh, with uh, with what they're they're doing with uh, not just uh, on the you know, obviously VoIP side, but with Troll One and and uh, so it's pretty exciting. So I'm uh, glad to have you on today, and and uh, yeah. hopefully by our next podcast we get all these damn uh, these bugs worked out. And so got to figure out how to edit the uh, edit that out when we put this out uh, on those uh, podcast apps. But no, seriously, Zane, thank you very much for joining me, man. It's uh, been a uh, been a pleasure this morning. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time, Kevin. It's been been a great conversation. I appreciate it. You got it. Thanks. There you go. Yeah.